Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about good plants, bad plants, and in essence, invasives and alternatives to those invasive species. And you know, I cannot do this by myself. I am joined, as always, by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. You ready for the cold weather? Nope. Uh, I used to love fall until I think these last couple of years, we've had like so much going on in the fall. It was like, uh, pulling plants, getting plants covered up, uh, for like research purposes. And now it's like, I'm dreading the cold. So, uh, how about yourself? Are you prepared for, uh, low temperatures in the thirties tomorrow night and the night after and the night after that? Yes. We started bringing plants in last night. So our House is now a jungle. All the plumeria trees are in, all of our citrus, tea, pomegranate, all that fun stuff. And and most of it's starting to put out flower buds now. So now I'm gonna have to go in and pollinate everything. <laughs> See, I my lemon tree looks amazing right now. That's absolutely beautiful. I'm like, is it about to flower? Because it's 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 grown massive. I don't know where I'm gonna put it. And um, it's probably the healthiest it's ever looked in the years that I've had it. So I wonder. Am I going to have some flowers popping pretty soon? But um, my my wife is very concerned because we have a new kitten and um, she's very good at digging in plants. And so she knows that when these plants come inside, we're going to have a problem. So uh, it, Ken, if you or if any listeners have any solutions to keep a cat from digging in plants, uh, right now, the only thing I've got is maybe some wire mesh or rocks, but I'm, I'm short yeah, on options. So we had two, we have two new cats that were dropped at my mom's house and somehow ended up at our house. Ah, it's a common and, uh, story. <laughs> and uh, so we had a bunch of cactus, I just in the little pots, you, know, you buy it in the nursery or Walmart or wherever. So I just put those in our bigger pots, <laughs> <laughs> keep them from Keeps. growing in there. It, it somewhat worked, somewhat mm -hmm. not. <laughs> I've also heard that plastic forks, the plastic forks in tines up well i think i read that for the my... garden i don't know about i would assume it worked for pots but i might try that because my good yeah um this this kitten and maybe she will break her of the habit here this winter but yeah plastic forks we might try that um you know i was just thinking of like that hardware cloth mesh and covering every single pot it's almost impossible for some of my plants so plastic forks can like a lot of talk. work too <laughs> yeah it's, it would be a lot of work oh uh, yeah that just set the kids up with the squirt gun to protect we, them. Yes, yes. Everyone's got their squirt gun, but you know how that's going to end, Ken. <laughs> the cat is the last one that's going to get uh, squirted with a squirt gun. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Well, um, you know, Ken, today we are talking about like good plants, bad plants. But I mean, maybe we should clarify right off the bat. Like plants have no... Uh, desire to be good or bad. They have no moral dilemma uh, in that realm of things. They are just plants. They're just responding to the environment, doing as nature has, has programmed them to do. And, and so even though we call these things good plants, bad plants, it's not really what we're talking about. What maybe are the better terms to use, Ken? Maybe invasive or rather aggressive. I think yes. the ones we're talking about today are, would be considered if not officially invasive, they're at least invasive all around us in the states around us. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Illinois is a bit slow on the, the poll here to get some of these named as invasives. Um, but and they're still sold very commonly in the landscape trade, uh, at least in my neck of the woods, Ken, I'm sure also your neck of the woods and listeners. I mean, they're, they're, they're all over nurseries in, in Illinois. So I can go to any nursery probably right now and find a lot of these plants that uh, we're, we'll mention. So, um, so yeah, so invasive, let's define this, Ken, I suppose. Uh, an invasive plant, when we use the term invasive, that's, that's pretty much like a legal term. Uh, it's, there are set lists that uh, the state of Illinois has created uh, with the legislature and government and everything. And it says these plants, it specifies the name of the plant, scientific name and everything. Are invasive. So, um, what? So, what? What does a plant have to do to get on this list, Ken? So, usually, it's 
but it's, it's kind of out competing other stuff pushing out you know a lot of times native species and just spreading rapidly and kind of changing ecosystems is usually how i how i think of it and, and like you mentioned it's invasive is, is defined you, know, you can't sell them in the state if they're listed as invasive and i think a lot of times this is probably another podcast in itself of you know a lot of times we just use invasive as a, as a catch-all yep um you know, for aggressive plants and things like that but it is a specific definition yes no I, there's definitely uh in my mind there is a distinction between an invasive plant which is again that legal uh, term and an aggressive plant and the aggressive plant you know that could be like the common blue violet it's it could be considered aggressive it's spreading all over your yard and you don't know what to do with it so is it invasive no to me that would be perhaps aggressive and then and it's it's in the eye of the beholder then is that indeed a weed in my yard it would not be um and actually it's the state flower for illinois so um you know so something to promote so i really like common blue violet it's one of my favorite ground covers out there so that i i didn't i hope i didn't steal your thunder ken but but yes no i would say <laughs> for invasive too those are going to be non-native plants as well yeah so non-native non-native plants um and it, the other thing too is like a dandelion is a non-native plant however it it's pretty much been here for a long time and it's it has established itself without out competing native plants and so and also dandelion in an urban landscape is is a resource for pollinators especially that early spring bloom that they do have when nothing else in uh like a in a city or a town is blooming so not yeah. all non-natives are bad so, yeah, so invasive is not native and it's causing ecological damage in mm -hmm. some way yep. whether that be plant or we're talking about plants today but that could be insects fish all kinds yes. of other things disease uh yeah um yeah any kind of that oh and <laughs> this will be another podcast too but um the feral hogs slowly moving their way from the south up uh into central and northern illinois so um mammals too you know it can be invasive species so something that we're gonna we have a lot of things to keep an eye out for these days yes job security that's right that's right <laughs> Um, well, Ken, I guess we should dive into uh, our good, bad plants. So why don't you go ahead and get us kicked off with your your bad plant and then uh, any suggestions for it? All right. So I picked winter creeper or Euonymus fortunii. And this is one of those plants, if I was king for the day, one of the first things I would do is ban this forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> wipe, wipe it out. Mm -hmm. um, so here in Illinois, it's not actually on the invasive species list, but I know in Indiana it is, and a lot of other states out east, uh, it is considered an invasive species, so you can't legally sell it uh, or move it around um, in those states. So this is native to Asia. Uh, it was introduced as an ornamental plant back in the early 1900s, um, like a lot of our other invasive species. And I think now we're a little bit better at screening stuff before we bring it in. Not to say it's not gonna happen, but a lot of our invasives were originally brought in uh, as an ornamental in this case is a ground cover so yeah. if you're not familiar very, with winter creep it, it was very deliberately brought in yes. like it was a a movement of organizations and people to bring these things in yes kind of like kudzu and mm -hmm. multi-flora rose and all, all that yes. fun stuff uh, so if, if you're not familiar with winter, with winter creeper uh, it's going to be an evergreen perennial a lot of times uses a woody ground cover um, but can also vine uh, up plants that's what a lot of times when it really starts causing problems um can also be kind of a small shrub a little bit grow about three feet tall um, and then when it vines it can be go up 40 to 70 feet uh, up in a tree canopy and when that happens it starts basically it'll choke off the tree and you know it can get heavy enough to start bringing limbs down and stuff uh, when those limbs die uh, a lot of times we see it kind of in um, forest margins or in, or in open patches in forests uh, where it'll get established this time of year well, yeah, it's probably starting to put on berries about now, and eventually when those are ripe, they'll turn red. Birds like them, so they will eat them and then deposit them for you elsewhere uh, in your landscape or in forested settings, things like that. 
I guess one of the reasons I really hate this plan is because the house we've moved into, uh, the neighbors behind us had a whole bunch that creeped into our yard. And it's taken me, it took us about three years to, to kind of get rid of most of it. And we still have it popping up uh, mm -hmm. here and there. So one of the issues with this is when it's kind of do, growing as a ground cover, it'll root, uh, the runners will root. So if you don't pull out the whole runner um, or leave fragments behind, it'll it's rooted, so it'll keep growing. Um, and then with the berries and stuff being deposited. So it's a, it's kind of a constant battle um, once you get it in there. So it's young plants are pretty easy to handle, especially if you've got some moist soil. Uh, they come out really easy. Even the larger vines will too. But again, if you leave any fragments behind, um, that'll keep growing again. Uh, and then you can use herbicides, glyphosate, triclopyr, uh, something like that. When I did it in my yard, I used glyphosate in it. It did a little bit of damage, but it was multiple applications mm -hmm. before you start, really started seeing damage in it, a lot of hand pulling. So, so like I said before, it took several years to really get it cleaned up in our yard. I guess in your description of how aggressive um, that root system is and how just a tiny little piece can send up a new plant, you know, you mentioned triclopyr and glyphosate. So those are systemic herbicides, which means you spray them on the plant and it translocates through the root system. Um, and, and even this plant itself still was able to re-sprout on occasions for you. Um, and I'm just kind of thinking in some of the questions that I've gotten about plants like, like winter creeper, where they want to do like a vinegar based herbicide or they want to do the boiling water trick. And it's like, okay, that might kill the living tissue that it touches, but it will not translocate into the root system to kill the plant itself. So uh, listeners, just keep that in mind. Glyphosate, triclopyr, systemic, it moves into the root system. Yeah, you're, you're bringing out the big guns for this. Stuff. And uh, those leaves are pretty waxy too, um, which can make it difficult to get that herbicide in, which I think is probably one of the reasons why you're looking at multiple mm -hmm. um, applications for it. But yeah. yeah. You're... Home remedies, which you shouldn't be using anyway, mm -hmm. um, probably are not going to do a lot. They'll just laugh yep. at you. You you are in danger of scalding yourself carrying that boiling pot of water out to those plants than yes. actually anything else. Yeah, yeah. So think of the acute danger versus the chronic danger. So it's uh, all different risks uh, that everyone has to weigh when dealing with uh, invasive or, in this case, aggressive plants. Yes. So yeah. So don't plant this one. Mm -hmm. It's it's. I've seen a lot in here in Jackson. A lot of people have it as a ground cover, or even they have it. I don't know if in, intentionally, but growing up trees and stuff. Personally, I think it's kind of ugly looking, but mm -hmm. that's just me. Um, yeah. And um, I, every once in a while, we get calls, and their winter creeper will be looking bad. It's like, oh, that's a good thing, but <laughs> they want to rescue it, so they have to tell them how to do it. But no. No, uh, <laughs> one day it'll be listed as an invasive species and we'll just say, ah, just, uh, you'll have to kill it. So, yes. <laughs> um, well, Ken, I, I guess the one thing when it comes with these ground covers, and I think, you know, this is why it was selected to be planted here in North America, um, is it just does a, such a good job. Nothing eats it. It establishes well. It doesn't need much care for that. Um, that's why it was chosen, I guess, by the landscape industry. Mm -hmm. And but in, in that same vein, I also have a difficult time coming up with alternatives. Like, so people are like, all right, well, then what should I plant? So what comes to mind is other non-natives like Japanese spurge or uh the Vinca vine, the uh, Vinca minor. So what do you have any other alternatives for for me in suggesting to people? Yes, there's so when you look on the internet, there's there's kind of all kinds of things thrown out. So I just picked kind of a handful here. So one that the several places recommend, um, several different universities is wild ginger. So that's mm -hmm. a native plant. Again, it's a good ground cover. Um, get about 40, 48 inches tall, has heart shaped leaves, um, and they have a, a kind of reddish brown flower that's actually underneath the leaf canopy. So you can't really see it, but if you you peek, you can find it. Um, and this is going to spread by um, seeds and roots. So similar to to winter creeper, but probably not as as aggressive and doesn't cause as many problems. And this is also a native species as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, you know, deer and rabbit resistant what we want. So this is one, an our native alternative that you could use as a as a ground cover. Uh, another one 
um, would be barren strawberry. So this is different than the mock strawberry that you get in your yard. That's kind of a weed. Um, this one is another low, kind of a mat forming ground cover. Gets about six inches tall, has yellow flowers in the spring. Um, and it'll spread by rhizome. So again, it'll, it'll slowly uh, increase in size. Um, it, it's it will do full sun to part shade. So again, kind of that similar sun exposure to, as a winter creeper will be. That does have um, evergreen leaves, but they kind of turn of a bronze uh, in the fall. So you get some fall color there. Uh, it is also deer and rabbit resistant too, if that's something you have to be uh, concerned with. Uh, ferns would be a good alternative too. Uh, again, another good uh, ground cover. And there's all kinds of different types of ferns, different heights uh, and stuff. One, if you're looking for something smaller, would be something like Christmas fern. Uh, it only gets one to two feet tall. And again, it's going to spread by rhizomes. You can have kind of form clumps that can be up to about two feet wide um, and also can be evergreen as well and also deer resistant. Um, well, sometimes we give these plant alternatives <laughs> and if it's not resistant to deer people get upset so I tried to find some of those. Um, and there's uh, sedges again and also another good ground cover. One that's that's pretty popular is Pennsylvania sedge. Uh, most sedges need pretty mm -hmm. fairly moist soil conditions, but Pennsylvania sedge does not. It can do well-drained soils, so depending on your site location, that could be a good one. Uh, what we'll do part to full shade. Uh, so again, like the winter creeper, it will handle the shade uh, as well. And this is going to spread by rhizomes as well. And if you have really good growing conditions, it may self-seed as well. So, so those are just some examples of ground covers. There's other things if you're looking at more sun, you could do like juniper um, or, or creeping flocks uh, stuff like that as well so there's there's all other alternatives i think the shade um, sometimes that gets a little tricky there's always hostas and there's the, always yeah, hostas <laughs> the, old, the old standby there yeah uh, too. well in, in terms of deers the deer and hostas of course deer eat hostas and um but i have found with winter creepers so my parents had a patch of winter creeper by in their front yard and deer don't eat it but there was there are periods of time in the winter where this evergreen winter creeper stands out and there's deer there munching on it even though i don't think it's very good for them so yeah. but when they're desperate and they're hungry yeah, they'll still hungry, eat it you're hungry enough you'll eat anything yes yes um and i don't think many people grow winter creeper for the vine for its vining mm -hmm. um but some potential alternatives um People may or may not like this one, Virginia creeper. Um, I think it's pretty. I like it. I leave it in my yard, but that's another one people may or may not um, may or may not like. But it's got some nice fall color uh, mm -hmm. on it. And then passion flower, um, so may pop purple passion flower, the Passiflora incarnata. That is a native species to Illinois, more southern Illinois, um, but I have grown to the last couple of years uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, and this one will get up to 25 feet long the vines will also grow along uh, the ground <clears throat> as well the passion flower i've got in my yard and um, this is the second year for it and i've got it popping up a couple feet away from the original plant so uh, keep we'll that an asterisk by that one yeah. <laughs> yeah keep that in mind you may want to have an area where it can spread or mine's all right along the driveway so it's not going to spread into the driveway but it is on the property line so i need to talk to my neighbors <laughs> Mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. sure they don't spray it so it doesn't kill my whole plant but if you're not familiar with passion flower they've got these really unique looking flowers kind of frilly i can throw a picture in for those of you on youtube to see um, and this particular one will also produce fruit that is edible um, it'll turn kind of an orange yellow uh, when it's ripe i have not gotten any ripe fruit off of mine uh, last year i had a couple fruit but we got a, a frost before it was um, ripe and this year i've got some that are starting to turn light yellow or light green yellow so i don't know if i'm going to have enough enough time this year uh, to get any fruit but we'll see and and for this one again this is the first year it came up over winter it came up late i thought it didn't make it it didn't actually start get kind of get going until late may early june so i was about ready to pull it out and get another one and try it but it eventually came up and now it's eating the uh we put in some T posts like the 10 foot and it's already top that and wow just going everywhere that's a this is a new one to me so yeah i'll 
I'll have to just swing by your house sometime and check it out and right. see what I think. <laughs> right by the driveway. So okay, <laughs> the big big green blob, <laughs> big green blob of passion flower. Another maybe one that I want to try, um, and it's not a permanent one. And maybe people like the permanence or the evergreen qualities of winter creeper, but um, may apple, which is like a woodland ground cover, is something that I would like to try. Maybe combine that with a couple other things like a trillium or something like that, or um, uh, or even foam flower. So uh, yeah, for Virginia bluebells. I'm I'm kind of thinking of this kind of spring ephemeral thing because um, that, that's when a lot of stuff really pops in that that shady area, and it acts as a ground cover in the spring, but it's not as permanent as say like yeah. follow up with ferns or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and ferns would then pop after those are done, and then they would be a bit more permanent through the fall, and it, some some even into the winter and such. So, there we go. Got your landscape all planned out now. Exactly. Now I just need money. <laughs> <laughs> just need some money to do all this stuff I want to do. Uh. All right. So that's that's what I've got. Um, you know, there's other stuff out there, so. If you're listening and you have other ideas, put those in the mm -hmm. in the chat or whatever they call it. Yeah, <laughs> whatever those kids call it these days. <laughs> At the bottom and stuff. Yeah, there's there's other stuff out there. There's all kinds of lists. Um, like bearberry, which I'm not really familiar with, was another one that I saw come up uh, quite a few times mm -hmm. uh, as far as a ground cover and stuff. So, yeah, if you're yelling at us right now that we forgot something, just just know there, there's a lot of lists, as Ken said, and <laughs> and uh, like I just did a my the recent blog was about attracting wildlife with native plants, and I know oak trees are like really good at that, but I just I wanted to list some things that were not oaks just for a little bit of diversity. I got some flack for that, so I might have to go <laughs> into our blog, Ken, and and yeah. add oaks <laughs> into there just because um, some people were not happy. Uh, yeah, yeah. maybe you're bonus tip of the week there you go there you go the oaks bonus are very good. <laughs> the oaks are great we love oaks we love them a lot and but sometimes we just want to talk about other plants so yes put a disclaimer at the top with a bunch of asterisks i'll just put that at, on every blog post uh asterisks oaks are good <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness well i i have a plant to share i got a bad plant to share we'll call uh we'll, we'll say it's aggressive I would call it invasive, but I don't make those rules. So, um, and that is Japanese barberry. Do you do you have any of these in your landscape, Ken? I do not, but I have seen them in gardens. There's not here in Jacksonville, but elsewhere I have. Mm -hmm. I have seen barberry for sale. You know, when I started out in the landscape design world, I loved barberry because. Um, working with clients it's something i would say i'm going to put this under your child's like bedroom window and no one's going to be able to sneak in there because of the the prickles or the thorns on the plant and it's like no one will want to go near that spot in the landscape because they they are like true to their name barberry like they have this barbs these thorns on them and they're not fun to prune or or, or do any work with it whatsoever so barberry by itself is a green shrub it's from Japan, uh, true to its name. And then there was a plant breeder, and then he found this purple uh, sport, or I think, I think was it, I don't know, can't remember if it was coming off of a green plant or if it was all its own purple plant, but he found this and it was actually a, um, I think it was a variety. Uh, so it was a purpurea so, yeah, so the scientific name is Berberus thimbergii var purpurea. And if I'm getting that wrong, people can correct me. So I, I think that's right. Um, so people love purple leaves. Um, we see that with all other types of landscape plants and stuff. And so they went crazy for this. Breeders went crazy with it. They started breeding uh, dwarf versions. Crimson, Crimson pygmy is a really popular one out there. Um, you know, this was, it's for the landscapes that I call them meatball landscapes, where you have these little balls of plants in your landscape and they don't touch each other and stuff. But um, so barberries work really well for that type of landscape. 
Um, and, but the thing is, with all of this breeding, all this new uh, different types of genetics coming onto the market, we suddenly started to get viable seed with Japanese barberry. And now I can go in the woods behind my house and I can find it. I didn't know what it was at first because it was green. It, it was coming up as green plants. Um, and I looked really closely and then I touched it and the, I knew as soon as I touched it, I got pricked in the finger. I'm like, that's barberry. And it was the green foliage. So it reverted back uh, to its, its green foliage from the purple plant. And it's all over the place in my woods. Uh, when we talk with our uh, forester, extension forester, Chris Evans, he says, we see this invading high quality woodlands, which is concerning um, that it can gain a foothold when a lot of other invasives don't. Um, so you can still go and buy Japanese barberry at the uh, garden centers. Uh, it is a very popular landscape plant but it is on my bad plant list because it really does get out there um, quite a bit. Similar to winter creeper that uh, produces a red seed in the fall and the birds take that and spread it everywhere. So in terms of controlling it, um, probably the best bet since you really do need to have gloves when, when handling, like if you want to try to pull it up, that, that is something, but definitely want like leather gloves when doing that. They're a little bit shallow rooted when they're little, seedlings popping up out of the ground so you can just pull them but once they get bigger it's really going to be a you could do a foliar spray which is like uh like a two to four percent glyphosate or triclopyr solution um or you can do a cut stump and for the most part i usually do a cut stump with these guys so basically i take a pruners or a loppers or whatever i need uh to make the cut I make the cut and then immediately like within five minutes i dab it with a wick applicator um with some glyphosate solution about 25 percent and um and, and that's the way to manage that or control that kind of a larger woodland setting otherwise you can just pull them up in a landscape bed if you see them start to spread everywhere yeah yeah the uh glyphosate triclopyr if you're doing invasive species that's the uh mm -hmm stuck up on that and if you ever see my blur is going to get rid of this but this um is uh, management of invasive plants and pests in illinois this is an extension document i mentioned him already but chris evans he worked with morton arboretum to get this put together probably if you have an extension office nearby illinois extension you they probably have these to give you i just hand them out for free um and we also you can also just go to the google or the bing do they still Yahoo? I don't know if Yahoo is still a thing anymore. <laughs> Yahoo still exists. It still exists. Okay. Um, you can go to the Yahoo even and type in uh, management of invasive plants and pests for Illinois. Um, and, and it will pop up as a PDF. It is a free download. It's a great resource. And it goes into timing. It has a phenology calendar. It goes into uh, mechanical control, cultural control, chemical control uh, for each species. And so check that out. And it, it's a really good resource. Yeah, I've got a I've got a box around here somewhere. We all we, need to find everyone it should before have people start coming. Yes, we I should hope to we all have boxes and boxes of these these books because they're and they're so popular when we're handing them out. People actually will flip through them like this is like super useful information. I'm like, I know, right? Yeah. Well, other things that can be planted for Japanese barberry. Um, so I had Japanese barberry in my landscape. We pulled it out, actually plopped a, um, a hydrangea in its spot. Um, and it was one of the, uh, it was a dwarf. Oh, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember my own plants that I planted. It was like winter fire or quick fire. It was dwarf quick fire hydrangea, which would be, is that a panicle? Oh boy. Can't remember things like this. You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just, just go back to Yahoo because it does exist as we've determined, and you can type in uh, "quick fire hydrangea." I did the little quick fire. It's a dwarf version, so that's the one that I swap mine out with, and it's doing fantastically well. But let's say you really like that meatball landscape of the Japanese barberry. Well, I have good news for you. You can swap it out with a boxwood. 
I mean, boxwood is evergreen. You can prune it or shear it into a little meatball if you like. And um, it's a very, actually, I think boxwood is probably one of the most popular landscape plants sold in, in nurseries today. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's a tough plant. Um, we could yeah, talk about for, so you yeah. look up for boxwood blight and <laughs> we could talk about boxwood insects blight, that go yeah. along with it, but yes, yes. So there are problems with boxwood. There definitely are. Um, and there's boxwood blight, which is threatening to wipe boxwood off of the North American face here, but, but that's another show. Um, so if you really, really want those, that meatball landscape, you can go for that. But Ken, you have one that I know is a great alternative is the winterberry holly, right? You have a couple of those. Yes. Yeah, so we've got maybe have five, five or six female plants in the male. So we have the, the berry poppins mm -hmm. um, is the female cultivar. And then Mr. Poppins is the male. And these only get really two, three feet tall, three, four feet tall, something like that. So we, we have a shorter um, variety cultivar, whatever it is. Cause I mean, the, straight species can get quite a bit taller than that so we've got Huge, as a, yeah. a foundation planting so we got the smaller mm -hmm. uh, types and there's dozens of different cultivars out there for, mm -hmm. for um, winterberry yeah i i remember seeing a lot of winterberry down in southern illinois uh just the straight species and that was like a large shrub small tree in some time in some cases so uh but ilex verticillata uh is the winterberry holly it has um uh, white flowers, I believe, in the spring, and yep. then it will retain some of that foliage, but then it will eventually drop, and you'll have these red berries that are left behind. It's a deciduous holly, which is really awesome. Uh, it has those red berries that are left behind. Yeah, if it gets snow, it looks really nice. That, yeah, it's got a really nice contrast um, with those red berries. And the birds last year, birds didn't really touch ours much. I don't know why, um, but birds will eat the berries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I found if I keep track of certain fruiting plants in the landscape. They retain their fruit in the winter. A lot of times it's in that mid to late winter time period and suddenly they're just gone. So it must be that, that maybe they're just waiting to eat it. I don't know. Yeah. Or um, give them enough bird food. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> you got fat, happy birds in your yard there. Um, if you're, so let's say um, you're not too thrilled about maybe swapping out with a boxwood. Another one could be inkberry holly. So we got another holly for you. So inkberry holly is another one that I, I first encountered in Carbondale, Illinois. And I was really impressed with it. It's like like one of our, it's like a native uh, quote unquote boxwood. Uh, it looks a lot like a boxwood. Um, and the scientific name is Ilex glabra. So it, it gets its name inkberry holly because instead of a red fruit, it actually has a dark like purple, blue, even blackish fruit. Um, and at least down in Southern Illinois, it's pretty much evergreen. It might lose some leaves as you get farther north in the winter months, um, but for the most part, considered evergreen. And you might wanna check the hardiness on that because uh, again, I don't see it as much in our neck of the woods, but there's a lot of breeding going on for this specific plant because they really like it. It has a lot of interest beyond boxwood, which is just green. So that's all it does, it's just green. <laughs> so we want, we want our plants to do more work than that in the landscape. So in terms of other alternatives for Japanese barberry, um, probably one that is really, I think, a, a great one to include because of that multi-season interest is the aronias. So there's melocarpa, there's arbutifolia, um, there's diff so different species of, of uh, aronia. Probably the one that I would really like to try is a cultivated form known as low skate mound. So you kind of notice like a theme with some of these shrubs. There are a lot, a lot of the ones, at least that I use are dwarf sized. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of homeowners are uh, when we look at a lot of the development habits or trends, houses are getting bigger, which means yards are getting smaller. Um, so the lot size is, is getting smaller even too. So they're, they're trying to cram bigger houses on smaller spaces. And so we need dwarf shrubs. So low scape uh, chokeberry, which is Aronia melocarpa, I believe, is a dwarf version of Aronia, white flowers in the spring, uh, develops uh, berries during the summer and late, late summertime period, which are actually edible, but it's called chokeberry for a reason. So 
keep keep that in mind. You need to add a lot of sugar uh, to whatever it is you make uh, with chokeberry. Sugar makes everything better. It always does. So yeah, in the theme of of berry poppins, sugar does help the medicine go down there. But um, uh, so, but otherwise, birds would eat it, and um, it does have. So low skate mound dwarf has a uh, red fall color. So it actually has like multi seasonal interest for it going for it. So it's um, it's it's one to check out. Uh, whether you do the low scape the dwarf one or you can just do the straight species of aronia, um, that it, it would. Be, be very pleasing, I think, to most people. Oh, and I, I almost forgot. I wanted to mention this, this one. Um, another really neat shrub that I see a lot of development uh, with is Father Gilla. Um, so there is Father Gilla, uh, I think it's uh, the dwarf one is Gardenii. Again, listeners, you got to correct us on these things. Um, but the, the dwarf Father Gilla, it is being bred to have different foliage colors. Um, so you have some that are a bit more green, you have some that are a bit more blue foliage, and then there's some that are bred for their fall color. Uh, so like a vibrant yellow with some of these. Um, and so Father Gilla is another one that I would love to try uh, in, my, in my landscape. And, and actually, I spent, when I was an intern at Missouri Botanical Garden, when you walk right in through that main entrance into the, that first plaza as it opens up and there's a fountain in the middle, that whole plaza is lined with Father Gilla. And I spent a few days hand pruning those because at Missouri Botanical Garden, they don't shear anything. It's all done by hand with hand pruners. So um, that's their claim to fame. What about like uh, nine bark? Yeah. Um, so I found one of those when uh, the uh, hardware stores put all their stuff on sale. One of them here in town has stuff 70% off. So we went <laughs> crazy. And they had a... a dwarf nine bark so it's only getting plant label said four ish feet mm -hmm. so that's got some nice purple foliage on it now i don't remember what the cultivar or anything is yeah so that's a great suggestion if folks are really set on that purple foliage the physocarpus is it diablo and then they have all kinds of other names like mini diablo and all that stuff uh has that that really deep uh, purple sometimes like I'll even look at them like that's almost black foliage on those plants and so yeah nine bark is would be a great alternative if you really want that that accent pop I think that Japanese barberry does give um, you know if everything's green 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 and boom you have this this purple right here bar uh, uh, physocarpus uh, nine bark would be a great alternative for that 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 accent use of that plant yeah where we put ours we've got a bunch of <clears throat> chthonia mexican mm -hmm. sunflower in the back and then the nine bark it is, it is a nice contrast i'll try yeah. to take I'll, a picture of it <laughs> take a picture of it and throw it in the in the podcast here that would be great oh and if folks want that um that alternative of keeping uh people peeping around your windows that the barberry that I, I used to sell that i used to use that trait to sell this plant to people so uh yeah i i've, I've learned my lesson but if you want to do that you know we have plenty of plants with thorns still uh, uh you know knockout rows technically prickles but still um if you just want some common landscape plant that you can plant and it will do really well knockout rows it will it will keep uh, the humans away for the most part. Yeah. As long as they're, <laughs> yeah. So knockout rows. Um, and, and of course there's so many different types of roses that that would be, um, that would be a year's worth of podcast in itself. Yeah, so yeah, Ken, that's, that's all I have. Oh, oh my gosh. I almost forgot, but they're also shrub dogwoods, red twig dogwood. You know, you could, you couldn't go wrong with that Arctic fire. Um, they, they can form colonies a little bit, so give them plenty of room if you're going to be putting something like that in, in the ground. Um, but yeah, that's, I think I have, I think I've gone through all the plants uh, floating around in my brain. Yellow twig dogwood. Red twig dogwood. Yellow. Yellow twig dogwood. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I only have red twig and it's actually a variegated form of red twig dogwood. Um, and so I, I really like it. It was there when we bought the house. And I'm doing my best to try to save it because it was not planted in a good spot. Yeah, we planted some. We were given some. Didn't make it. I think yeah. one of them did just die. And I think the other one 
rabbits got to it and that mm-hmm. was the end of that yeah the the red twig is in our yard is limping along we do have a gray dogwood which is a much taller almost small tree in our yard that is is fan, doing fantastically so yeah and the, that's a little bit bigger than a barberry and the red twig that's on the red's only on the younger stems right you have to keep that pruned the older they get yeah the worse the red coloration is and so it's hard for people to do this but yeah you got to cut out those bigger stems if you want that red color well that was a lot of great information about bad plants and then maybe some alternatives for good plants Uh, but when we talk about this folks remember we are talking uh aggressive plants in terms of this podcast because both winter creeper and Japanese barberry are not listed as invasive species at least in Illinois even though they are in all the states surrounding Illinois so um again species well, of concern so they, let's call them species of concern yeah let, we can we can name them that um and so uh, folks the kind of the reason you know why we we talk about this um you know Ken, myself, we work with other people that help to manage uh, natural spaces and natural areas. They fight these plants all the time. Um, you know, it's important to to mention some of these alternatives so that when you go to the nursery, you can ask the nursery about if they have some of these alternative plants. Um, and then it might might be kind of a, a signal to them, maybe we should sell these. So, so yeah. Well, Ken, what, what, what else is there to add about uh, some of these uh, nasty nasties? So if you see if you got them in your landscape, get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Plant plant something else. Yep, and encourage yep. your friends to do the same. Mm-hmm. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension. Uh, this week, edited by Ken. Uh, so thank you, Ken, for editing the podcast and also being with me here today. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for being here with me. Let's uh, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. I think we might do this exact same thing next week because the list of species of concern is long. Um, There's still a lot of plants that get sold in the landscape trade uh, beyond what we've talked about today. So we are going to cover two more of those same plants next week and their alternatives. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.